Let's start again. It seems to me like you kind of have gotten to know each other pretty well here. You, you seem to communicate, which is nice. Okay, so uh, let's hope it continues like this. So you don't start to fight. Not that we have any experience. Uh, it w you were right about this Danish. It was a Danish phone call. It was a Danish journalist who wanted to make an interview. Do you think I should call him back? Yeah. I think no. <laughs> Do you know why? Because I don't understand Danish. And it's so embarrassing to start speaking English with a Dane. Danish is extremely hard to understand. But about you, Icelandic, do you speak Norwegian? No. Not at all? Well, yeah, you understand a little, don't you? Yeah. Do you understand Danish then? Uh, we studied Danish in, uh, in school. You st studied Danish in school? Well, like, I don't know, seven, eight Why did you do that? Denmark doesn't own Iceland, does it? I, that was before the Second World War. Yeah, okay, so it's kind of a traditional. Okay. Yeah, you should stop learning Danish. It's not, not a language to learn. You know, the Danes, they occupied Norway for 400 years. We don't like that. There are no Danes here, is it? No. I think there are no Danes here, so I can say that. Uh, okay, let's move back to the exercise. We need now to calculate these elasticities. As we have given the values, we can probably use these, these uh, calculations here to find uh, at least some of the unknowns. So we start by computing the derivative OQ with respect to the variable P, both for these, the demand function, as well as these, the supply function. And that's easy to do, isn't it? You see that the derivative of this one with respect to P is minus B, which this equation tells us why the derivative of this function with respect to p is plus d, which this equation tells us. You also see that I, I kind of put up this way of writing a derivative as well as another way, which is perhaps more known, where you put this prime on just to, to symbolize that it's a derivative. <coughs> then we can use this equation now, can't we? We can put in the P and the Q from the equilibrium solution. The price was $5 a package and the number of packages was 15.75 billion packs. We omit the billion and we put that in for P and Q in this formula. Then we enter the derivative, which in the demand case was minus B, so we enter that as well. And we equate that to the value which, which was given for the demand supply, which was 0 0.4. So this construct gives us a single equation which turns out to contain only a single unknown. So we can find the b directly here by just manipulating this expression. Of course, we can do the similar thing on the supply curve. It's still 15 over 15 point, sorry, 5 over 15.75, which is the first part of this fraction. But the derivative is now d and not minus b. And it should not equal minus 0 0.4, but it should equal 0 0.5, which is the supply elasticity. So that gives us first this equation which helps us to find B and this equation which helps us to find D. Then we just have to mani in man uh, manipulate these two equations. We can for instance in the first one multiply with 15 over sorry uh, I can do it on the board perhaps. Okay. We have uh, this equation here Okay, that's the first one. That is. Ah, you're following up. Not 17.5. Very nice. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, we, we should perhaps immediately see that there's a minus here and a minus here, meaning that we can kind of multiply with minus one on each side, so we can just take that one out, can't we? It equates on both sides, so we don't need to bother with the minus. And then perhaps the easiest way of doing it is to multiply here on both sides with 15.75 over 5. That would produce 15.75 over 5 times 5 over 15.75 times B equal 0 0.4 times this one, 15.75 over 5. And of course, everything can be reduced here and then you end up with b equal to this expression here. 
if you want to calculate these expressions, of course, then you need a calculator, okay? Unless you're very good in mind calculations. I want to test these. It turns out to be 1.26. So here, use a calculator, okay? Just to do it very precisely, okay? You can also use Excel if you like. Same procedure on the other equation. Again, multiply with the same number to get this one away. Then the D is, is almost the same. It's 15 over 15.75 over 5, but not multiplied with 0 0.4, but multiplied with 0 0.5. Yeah. So that produces a B and a D. Okay, we have found two of the unknown variables in our equations, B in pan up here and D down there. So we still need to find A and C. Okay. And that can be found by two equations related to the equilibrium point. When we have given the equilibrium point, which we have here, if this is price and this, sorry, let's stick to the normal way now, if this is quantity and this is price, we know that this point here is at a quantity of 15.75 and a price of 5, don't we? So we have this point here. This point is given and we know that both these two lines go through that point. And we have the equations for the lines, now each involving one unknown, okay? So we just enter that point into each of these two lines, equation 10 and 11, that produces two new equations to find the remaining two unknowns, which are A and C. This is done here. This is the quantity. It should equal A, which is unknown, minus the B we found, which was 1.26, times 5, which is the equilibrium price, which is the demand curve, and then we do the same for the supply curve. 50.75 equals C plus 1.575 times 5, and that produces A equal to 22.05, and C equal to 7.873. Of course, again, it seems like a calculator is necessary here, unless, again, you're very good in mind calculations. So then we can finally put up these two curves we were looking to find. The demand curve is 22.5, minus 1.26p, while the supply curve is 7.875 plus 1.575p. If you like, of course, you can plot the curves. I did that here. They turn out to look like this. Of course, they are again linear. There is no nonlinear terms here, so it's, it's straight lines. And of course, they should intersect in the equilibrium point, which seems to be 5 down here and 15.75 up here. So it seems to correspond. Of course, that's what you should get in this situation. Okay, any questions to this one? So far, so good. B. Now we finished A, okay, B. In 1998, what does this mean? Ah, problem with the computer. In 1998, Americans smo smoked 23.5 billion packs of cigarettes. So now we're moving to a different year, aren't we? We're moving back in time now. From 2010, then we move 10 plus 2 years back, 12 years back to 1998. In those days, Americans smoked even more, didn't they? They smoked actually 23.5 billion packs of cigarettes. So it has been a substantial reduction from 1998 up to 2010. 23.5 is not twice as much as 15.75, but it's, let's say, yeah, something around 60-70% more in, in, in 98. Why is that, do you think? Why did Americans stop smoking? That's what you see here, isn't it? Uh, they probably found it dangerous, huh? 
Yeah, of course, smoking is very dangerous, as you know. Maybe the price went up. I don't know. In that, it seems that the price has gone up. Yeah, that kind of thing, yeah, that probably also had some effect, but may maybe the main effect is uh, Maria, wasn't it? Maria's point here, you see the price in 98 was only $2, okay. No, I said you said his point? Yeah. I thought you said my point. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there are several reasons for this. One is the certain regulations making it illegal, a lot of health campaigns stating how dangerous it is. It, it it's has been gradually more and more dangerous as time has moved, hasn't it? Um, uh, and... Uh, but I think the main point is this number here. Of course, when, when you're an economist, you believe that the economy is the driving force about every decision, don't you? <laughs> so, moving from $2 a package in 98 up to $5 a package in 2010 is a huge price increase, isn't it? It is 250%, actually. Of course, they, they earned a little bit more, but I don't think the, the salaries went up that much. I think they maybe went up, let's say, 50% in that period. But of course, the price rise on cigarettes was much, much higher. Of course, it could be that uh, the Americans substituted cigarettes with marijuana for, I don't know, I don't know, maybe that's what happened. That's an option. But in any case, that's the information we have here. The decline in cigarette consumption from 1998 to 2010 was due in part to greater public awareness of the health hazards from smoking but was also due in part to the increasing price. So we got the explanation here, didn't we, in the exercise. Suppose that the entire decline was due to the increasing price. Okay, so now we make that assumption. So we say that, okay, we don't believe in these health campaigns. If Americans understood that cigarettes was dangerous in 98, uh, they still understood the same in 2010, so it didn't really have any effect. But uh, of course, this is not correct. What would you deduce from that about the price elasticity of demand? So the point now, of course, is that you can, you can kind of recalculate a new price elasticity of demand given this information, because now you suddenly have a, a new amount here of, uh, of uh, you have, a, in fact, a new equilibrium point. Haven't you? you have a 23.5 billion and a $2 per pack. Now let's look at how I did this in the, in the solution. <coughs> if the price change only produced a change in quantity, a new demand elasticity can be deduced by, okay? Because now we have suddenly a given price point, a price of $2 per pack and a quantity of 23.5, but we also have the, the information we need related to the discrete version, because we now suddenly have two points where we can make these differences. So we have this 23.5 minus the price, uh, which was the price in 98 minus the, <sighs> sorry, this is the quantity in 98, which was 23.5 billion, and then we just subtract the quantity in 2010, which was 15.75, and then we divide by the price change in the similar period, which, which was from 2 and up to 5. And then that produces a uh, demand elasticity kind of linked to the 98 year now, or minus 0 0.22. And the one we kind of found up here actually was given originally was 0 point minus 0 0.4. So it seems in a way that um, reality, which based on this observation, maybe it didn't really fit with the initial information we had at, at the year 2010. But of course it could be that the demand elasticity kind of measures how a consumer would uh, judge and price increase and his kind of how much less or more he would, actually less he would buy a product. And, uh, and it could very well be that uh, the changes over time here affects this demand elasticity. We should not expect that a demand elasticity is the same in two different time points. That doesn't necessarily be the case. So it's kind of not necessarily should we say a static kind of measurement. It should should perhaps change uh, over time. Okay, that was the price elasticity effect of this new information in this exercise. 
Okay, these exercises was related to the first two chapters. Then we move into exercises related to chapter three. Yes, Mario? There's a question, what would you use from the number? What, so what would I use these number for? Yeah, so no. And I would wha basically what I said that it, it turns out that the amount of elasticity kind of is much smaller in 98 than in 2000. If, if this is a correct number, then it would mean basically that of course, the higher this negative number is, the kind of more the price would affect, wouldn't it? So it should mean, in a sense, that if you're interested in getting even more Americans to stop smoking, you don't have to change the price as much. Okay, that's the meaning because it's 0 0.4, so they kind of react more heavily to the price than they did in '98 when it was 0 0.22. That could be relevant information, couldn't it? I would say so. If I were interested in making people stop smoking, which I buy them, is of course, it's very dangerous and it's very negative to the to your surroundings. So you, you see, it seems like it's, it's not necessary to, to spend so much public money on making more Americans stop smoking. But again, this is, uh, this is kind of just what we can read out of it. It doesn't mean to, it doesn't need to be the truth. <laughs> uh, it could be that those who keep on smoking, they are much harder to turn around, okay? They are more addicted. Maybe the price kind of takes out these not so heavy addicted people, they, they can stop smoking. But th those who are very heavily addicted, they can't stop. Okay? Just like those who, who uh, they, they, they normally say, you know, that it's as hard to stop smoking as it is to stop with heroin. That is kind of a common truth in this area. We know we have this health department, they keep telling me this. And I'm very happy that I've been able to stop smoking. Unfortunately, I use something else, which is kind of has the same effect, but... Uh, so I'm, I'm still a, an, an addict then, okay? So you see, some people have tr problems uh, quitting uh, tobacco, or actually the poison here, which is nicotine, as you probably know. So the best thing is not to start this stuff, okay? Keep out of it, okay? It doesn't bring you any good, it doesn't improve your health. You're not any more popular amongst the, the other sex or the same sex or whatever you prefer. It doesn't matter at all. So s keep out of it, okay? That's the, the main uh, thing here. Okay, then we move to chapter three and there is an exercise here where we, which involves these two girls, Bridget and Erin. Erin is a girl's name, isn't it, Eric? In English? Erin? Yeah? It can be both. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, we have some names in Norwegian that can be both as well, if I, when I think about it. But it, it's kind of uncommon. Okay, so maybe it's both uh, bo boy and a girl then, perhaps. Uh, so suppose that Bridget and Erin spend their incomes on two goods, food F and clothing C. Bridget's preferences are represented by the utility function U of F C equals to 10 F times C. So it's 10 times F times C. That's the meaning of 10 F C. Okay, re remember that? If it is... 10 FC, it actually means 10 times F times C, or if you like to, some of you I see uses this sign. <coughs> so that's, it means all the same, okay? Uh, While well Erin's preferences are represented by the utility function UFC equals to 0 0.20 times F squared times C squared. So there are two different utility functions here for two different persons, which is kind of what we would expect based on how we discuss these topics. We said that kind of it's a utility function, which is, 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 it is something which is linked to the individual. Okay? Individual preferences both are different and, as we also argued, should be different. Okay? Because if individual preferences are not different, then the world would stop. Okay? So all these guys who want to make everything equal they predict a learning which I don't like, okay, because it's kind of against any sensible economist thought. Okay, you should, on the other hand, try to make it as different as possible. The more difference there are in preferences, the more development and research would be the result. What's the point of doing research if everybody wants to eat the same? Why, why would you try to produce new foods? That doesn't make much sense, does it? Okay, with food on the horizontal axis and clothing on the vertical axis. Uh, this is the vertical axis, isn't it? 
and this is the horizontal axis, or am I wrong? This is vertical, this is horizontal, yeah, the horizon is like this, isn't it? And so there's food on the horizontal axis and clothes on the vertical axis. Identify on a graph the set of points that give Bridget the same level of utility as the bundle 10, point five, 10 and 5. Okay. So what we're aiming to do here is to find indifference curves, isn't it? That's how we define them, indifference curves. They are such that on any point on this curve, utility is the same. The only thing we need now is to kind of put these bundle 10, 5 into the utility functions to find the utility level. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, maybe we won't finish today, then we continue and finish this tomorrow morning. Okay. Well, not tomorrow morning, but tomorrow. So let me just make some space here. We had one utility function for bridge set, let's call that UB. It had arguments FC and it was equal to mm, 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 10 FC. And we had another utility function which was on behalf of Arian. Same arguments but a different function 0.2 F squared c squared that was the given information and now we're asked to find uh, these uh, indifference curves okay and we have given the point here but we haven't given the actual utility so we need to enter this point 10 5 into each of these utility functions and hopefully we get the same answer then on both it could happen that we don't in that case we have to use different numbers but uh, putting these into this one as well as this one produces 10 times 10 times 5 in this case 0 0.2 times 10 squared times 5 squared if this is f and this is c yeah that should be correct this is 100 times 5 which is 500 5 squared is 25 10 squared is 100 isn't it 100 times 25 is 2500 2500 times 0 0.2 is perhaps 500 or isn't it that right uh, it's the same as the it's the same as dividing by 5 isn't it multiplying by 0 0.2 is the same as dividing by 5 so you might as well do it like this 5 or 25 so it's 500 I just entered these two numbers into each of the utility functions and show that they provided the same value for utility, in this case 500. What can I help you with Arnur? Are you, is there something you need? No, I'm sorry. No, okay. Uh, I, the meaning was not to be rude, okay? But, uh, okay, so then we are aiming to find two sets of indifference curves which has you leak 500 on both of them okay that's the idea so uh, to solve that we just do follow the recipe here we then put ub ofc equal to 500 on for both utility functions and we solve this typically with respect to c in this case given that we want to have the axis as this so let's do that we enter 10 f c equal to 500 that's the first one then we get c equals to 500 divided by 10 times f don't we by dividing by this term we isolate the c on the left hand side and we get this construction as the formula for the first indifference curve we can make a reduction here 500 over 10 is 50 so this should be 50 over f, shouldn't it? That is the formula or the equation which describes Bridget's indifference curve for a utility value of 500. Similarly, for this Arian utility function, which is this one, same way of doing this. In that case, it's 0 0.2 f squared c 
squared equals 500. Okay, again, we want to solve this with respect to C. Then we have to divide to get this part over here. So we end up with C squared equal to 500 over 0 0.2 times F squared, don't we? Are you following me now? You want this one on the right hand side, we have to divide by this one on each side, then this one vanishes and it comes back under the fraction here. To get the single C we need to take the square root out of each side here, don't we? Yeah. So if we take the square root of this one as well as the square root of this one, it's still an equality. If 9 equals 9, then of course the square root of 9, which is 3, equals the square root of 9 which also is 3. So we can always make that operation. So we end up with c equal to, and now I want to write this a little special, square root o, how should I write it? Mm -hmm. I can write it like this, can't I? Do you see that? I when I take the square root here and here, I can take the square root of f squared to get f, okay? So that is remaining. But I have to stick to this one unless I can find a number for it, which is 500 by 0 0.2. That's the same as multiplying by 5, isn't it? So it's 2,500. So it's the square root of 2,500 over f, actually. What's the square root of 2,500? Is it 500? No, it's 50. So it's 50 over f. Ah, oh nice. That's the same as we got here, isn't it? This halves our work, we only have to draw one indifference curve because it's the same for both of these two utility functions. Do you see that? Even though they are different, they look different, this one has squares, they produce the exactly the same indifference curve. In this case, they are given, yeah. They are given, if you mean given by these, yeah. You don't get this one from. They don't pop down to your head for some reason, okay, if that's your question. They are given in the exercise, yeah. But the interesting thing here is that these two indifference curves turn out to be equal, okay. Let's look here. The same argument is, of course, done similarly in the solution here, given utility functions, so and so. Uh -huh, we do these calculations, find, five, 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 find 500 there, 500 there. Then we put up these equations, which is the same as what we put up over here. And then we solve, uh, and it says, hence, it's useless to plot both, okay? They have identical indifference curves. Maybe I have made a plot of them some, somewhere down here? No. No. And are, these are for two different utility levels, sorry. Okay. Now, I didn't make the plot where it was to do the plot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same for it on a separate graph, okay? Yeah, it, it's the same graph then, if you like. And then we look at a different bundle. Or so actually we change this 10.5 into 15.8. Okay. And then it finally says in the end here, do you think Bridget and Erin have the same preferences or different preferences? Explain. Okay. Now what we have seen here is that the indifference curves are equal. Okay. We have found that mathematically. That should mean that the preferences are equal, shouldn't it? Because an indifference curve defines preference for a consumer. So this should lead us to start thinking here. It may be that there is a lot of these different utility functions which actually means the same, they have the same meaning. And it turns out that you can do a set of different transformations on these indifference uh, utility functions 
as long as you transform them positively, they cannot mean the same. Okay, so if you see here, to some extent, this utility function is kind of the quadratic version of this one, isn't it? If we square this function, we get, of course, 100, uh, 100 here, but we get f squared times c squared, which we have here. And a constant change does not affect the indifference curve level. So any kind of what we refer to as monotone transformation is kind of legal on these kind of utility functions. It will not change the behavior or the preferences of the consumer. So as long as we kind of... Yeah, yeah, I think that's enough to say here. Okay. So the idea of this one is to give you some more learning actually, meaning that we have some freedom when it comes to picking utility functions. And to actually construct different utility functions, we have to be slightly careful. Because it might seem here that we actually have two different utility functions, but in reality we don't. Okay? Yeah. As long as they produce identical indifference curves, they also reflect the same preferences for the, these two consumers. So it turns out that, that Bridget and Erin here, they are clones. Okay? because I already told you that there are no human beings who has the same preferences. So in this case, of course, there could perhaps be persons who have the same preferences related to food and clothing, although I doubt that. Okay, if you look at the solution here, it's perhaps a little bit more technical. Okay. I say here it's easier and far more convenient to investigate these exercises as well as question C by looking at indifference curves in general. Let us define the union as a constant. And then I and then I I do a construction of an indifference curve here. Okay? But instead of picking a certain level of utility, as I did in that case, and that basically means that I I I I told you something which is not slight completely correct, yeah, because what we showed here was that for the utility level of 500, they have the identical utility curves, uh, identical uh, indifference curves. But the question is, do they still have that if we change this number? And then that I can show by kind of putting in a general utility here, when I find the form for the, for the indifference curve. So instead of putting 10 FC equal to 500, I'll suddenly put, put in UB, which is uh, what was the name of this person? I've forgotten. Yeah. Hopefully it is sensible. And then of course you do the same mathematical structure here. You just divide by F here and you divide by 10. And then you get something like this. You do similarly here. 0 0.2 times F squared times C squared equals to UE. And then you can do this square root to get rid of this one. And then you see that if you look at general indifference curves for any utility level are shaped equally here. They are kind of mathematically shaped equally in the sense that there is some constant divided by f. But this constant is different. You see that? So ub over 10 may not necessarily be equal to uc over 0 0.2. It is the case when utility equals 500. In that case they are equal. But apart from that there is some differences. So they do not have identical preferences but they they have the same structure, if you like. They differ by a constant only, as it says here. And then it says, the real point of utility functions is to preserve inequalities. So we can transform utility functions as long as given inequalities are preserved. The reason what we do here is, of course, is that, uh, you, you kind of construct a function that says that if you prefer something over something else, then the utility of that first something should be bigger than the utility of the second something. Okay? That's the idea of a utility function. And as long as these preferences, which kind of const constructs the utility function, are preserved, then you can, of course, use any kind of utility function you like, which keeps this structure. This is named monotone transformations in mathematical language, as it says here. If we compare the utility functions here, we can observe that Erin's function is a quadratic transformation of Bridget's. So we, we, we change it by kind of raise it to the power of 2, that's the meaning of a quadratic transformation, and we also change the constant. However, a quadratic transformation is only monotone for positive values, as you probably know. 
what we what we're aiming for in this transformation is that there should be there should be some kind of increasing function which defines the transformation. A quadratic function looks like this, doesn't it? It I increases in this area, but not in this area, and that is kind of the, the problem here. It doesn't keep, it doesn't hold these mathematical properties. But now we are kind of moving far out into stuff that you, you, you really shouldn't know or shouldn't care about. Okay, so there's some examples here on, on how it could, and uh, how a quadratic transformation wouldn't work depending on the 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 the, the sign of the of the number. Okay, uh, I think the idea by the exercise is to try to give you some more information than it's already in the textbook. To say there is something peculiar about these utility functions. We can change them, perhaps without much effect. Uh, and we see here that a certain utility level produces identical indifference curves, but a general utility level produces similar indifference curves, but which are not identical. It is uh, the square root of 0 0.2 isn't 10, is it? No, it can't be that. So u over 10 is not equal to the square root of u over 0 0.2. So, that, so we get different utility functions. Now if you look at uh, I thought I made a graph here, didn't I? Yeah. Now this is a different exercise, isn't it? Or is it the same? Yeah, it's a different, sorry, it's a different exercise. Is, huh? No, you have to repeat. I didn't. Um, if they have, they have different uh, utility curves. If they have different indifference curves. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If they have different if indifference the curves. Function is, is not the same. But uh, when they add the ten five on, yeah ten five pound, they have the same utility. If they have the same utility, means that uh, they the curve is completely. Yeah, it's it's the indifference curve is on top of each other. Of course, it's the same curve. So if you draw it, it comes exactly on top. But the point here, I think, is that this only holds for a certain utility level. So so the indifference curves are exactly equal for u equals 500. But if u is different from 500, then they're not equal. Then they suddenly separate. But they don't separate much structurally. They just kind of move a little bit on top or on bottom. That's basically what's happening. But of course, their preferences are different. If the, if the indifference curves are not the same, then they have different preferences. Uh, and uh, I use the uh, UE function as the 20 f square c square because I don't know if it's uh, 0 0.2. And I get the same consequences of this question. You did? They, they have uh, the same. Yeah, for 500 then? You did that? Yeah, I did with, with the 20. With 20, yeah. yeah 20. But, uh, but if you see the answer here, you shouldn't really get that for, uh, I can't understand. In, in that case, uh, you see, uh, 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 you see this one, okay? No, what, what you say here is that, what you say here is that this one, is the same as this one. No, I said as I use a function is 20. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, so there could be several points where they are kind yes. of, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. I haven't checked that. Yeah, but this is kind of, yeah, on the outskirts of what I will test you on, on this exam then to, to put it directly, okay? Meaning that you won't get these kind of questions on the exam, perhaps. <laughs> okay, let's move to the final exercise. <sighs> There's five minutes left. My suggestion is that we stop now and we take this one tomorrow. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, because <laughs> if we start, it just kind of we, we are not able to to get any way anyway. So, do you have any questions? Is there something you want to ask me?
Is everything clear? I, I assume you observe just one word, uh, one more, okay? I assume you observe that the exam, exam is given at the 21st of October, okay? Which is around a month from now, now, isn't it? Yeah. And there's a four hour written exam starting at nine, ending at one, okay? So this will be your first exam here ever, wouldn't it? Yeah. So I have to make it in a way that you, you're happy when you finish, okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just, you have to come here in good time before nine o'clock and then there will be some name lists which sends you to the room where the exam is, okay? You should bring written uh, pencils, pens, whatever. A calculator may be nice in this course, although I don't really think you will need it, but it may, you may bring it, okay? And then there is a question. Do you want to have an open book exam? Mm -hmm. yes. Or do you want to have a closed book exam? Open, closed. open book. You think that's closed. easier? Closed. 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 Let me give you some added information. No, yeah. If you have an open book exam, then the exam will be more difficult. If you have a closed book exam, then of course you have to mem remember some stuff here, okay? So <laughs> ah, yeah, I'm sorry, it depends on your choice. I, I take it that you would like a closed book exam. That means that you can't bring the book or any other written aids to the exam, and you are definitely not allowed to communicate with, with each other during the exam. If you are, then we kick you back, kick you out, okay? So be careful with that. Do not communicate. That's something we do not like here, okay? On those exams. Okay, that was just about the exam, but it's kind of coming up, so we need to start preparing for it. Okay, have a nice day. Watch more football. <laughs>